Good morning. Bonjour. I'm the translator of. Uh... Yes. So I will just speak in Dutch, okay? Okay. And you will translate. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good morning, everyone. Before we start, I'm going to make a picture because no one's going to believe that so many people are interested in using more than one framework. There we go. Good morning. Let's start. Um, Welcome to this talk about using Sufi and Zen Framework 2 in the same project. Um, two days ago we were both at ZenCon and we sat down to prepare this talk and we decided that we're going to do it all over. So in two days we've done some really nice work, I think at least, we've done some really nice work and we're going to show it to you right now. But before we start, let's introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Stefan Komerschap, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I run a company called Ingewikkeld, which is the Dutch word for complex or complicated, which is how I like my projects. Uh, I also run the Academy together with a friend of mine, Joshua, uh, which is a training company. I am a member of the Dutch Web Alliance. Um, I'm the Symphony Community Manager, and I was co-founder of PHP Benelux, and I'm active with the PFZ user group right now, and also PHP Armsford, which is a very local user group. If you want to contact me at some point, that's my email address, um, and we'll publish the slides afterwards. So just feel free to email me if you have any questions. And uh, I'm Enrico Zimor. I'm a software engineer at Zen Technologies. I work in uh, the App Agility and uh, Zen Framework team. And uh, as you can recognize from my brilliant accent, brilliant English accent, I come from Italy. Uh, I am the co-founder of the PHP user group of Torino, the city uh, where I live. And this is my email address, enrico at zen.com. I'm the only Enrico in the company, so you cannot get it wrong. They don't want to hire too many Italians. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, PHP frameworks in general, who here in this room is using a framework right now? Okay, who is using Zen? Who is using Symphony? Yeah, it's, about, it's about half. That's yes. good. That's good. Okay, so um, Symphony and Zen framework are currently, I guess, the most popular and widely used PHP frameworks um, in the world, uh, and both have a lot of features that you can use. And really, um, it doesn't matter which framework you use. Um, because as long as you use a framework, I guess that's the most important thing. It's you've got so many things that uh, the framework developers have thought about before they started building it. So you get a lot of um, uh, best practices when you start using a framework. The architecture has been thought of. Um, there's not a lot of like reinventing the wheel going on anymore, um, and but. If, if you use one framework and you just stick with that framework and everything that's not in that framework, uh, you build it yourself, um, you're basically doing the work that people have done already. So why should you not use uh, more than one framework in your project? There's really no reason to stick with only one framework. So this was a Dutch PHP conference, uh, I don't know. 2010 or something like that, uh, where Fabien, who is the founder of a Symphony Framework, and um, Matthew, who is the lead developer of Zen Framework, uh, get, got together and they started talking to each other. And ever since then, I took this picture, ever since then this picture has been making the rounds as to, you know, they actually talk to each other. Um, there's been a bit of a... <laughs> Well, religion war is what the title says. There's been a bit of a um, struggle every once in a while between Symphony and Zen Framework, at least between the communities. Like, we're the best, and we're the best, and everyone knows Symphony is the best. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, um, Matthew and Fabienne have, have been in touch with each other for, for a long time to try and solve the same problems in the same way and try to learn from each other. So really, there is no religion war, at least there shouldn't be. So instead of thinking about, should I use Zen Framework 2 or Symphony 2, 
you should look at, at it in this way. Think about it like, oh, I should use Zen Framework 2 and Symfony 2 in the same project. And actually, this, I mean, I, 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 I like Symfony for as far as that wasn't obvious yet. But most of my projects have at least one Zen Framework component in them. Really? Yes, really. So how, why, why, so how does it become, uh, did it become that easy? Um, at some point, and at, I know Larry is in the room, uh, Larry was doing a talk uh, at True North PHP in Toronto last week, and he was talking about this meeting that happened at Tech 09 that he didn't actually uh, attend at that time. But he was very spot on with his description of what happened there. There were a lot of people from the major frameworks getting together in one room and trying to solve a problem. And the problem was, if I want to include something from Zen Framework, something from Pear, something from Symfony, and something from, I don't know, Codeigniter, then I need to have four autoloaders and include a lot of files, and that's really annoying. So uh, at some point, all these people got together uh, in one room and tried to solve a problem. The only problem was then they announced the solution as being the one standard that will solve all your problems, which caused a bit of a riot in the PHP community. But something good came out of that, and that's the PSRs. And the PSRs are basically recommendations that will help make your code easier and better organized. It's mostly meant to make frameworks work together in, in a good way. Um, and it's, it's mostly meant to make your life easier if you want to work with more than one framework at the same time. So all the frameworks now use, or at least the frameworks that implement the PSRs, they now use one naming standard and one coding standard uh, and one organizational structure of your directories and stuff like that. So you have one autoloader and that autoloader can load basically all the libraries that implement the PSRs. Uh, there is a website for that, you can check it out. Um, so let's go through the standards that we have right, or the recommendations uh, that we have right now. PSR0 is, well, because we're developers, we start at zero, not at one. PSR0 is the autoloading standard, it's a naming standard. So you have a vendor namespace, then you have the namespace for whatever component you're working in, and then you have either more namespaces or a class name. Um, and each name basically reflects the directory on your disk as well. So it's very easy to look at a class that includes the whole full namespace and see where it's located on your disk. Um, and since all frameworks use the same namespace or naming standard, it's very easy to load in different frameworks. Then PSR1 uh, is uh, the basic coding standard. Um, it has a couple of, uh, it has a, a, lo a lot of rules that you can, that you can follow. Um, and the idea behind this is that all the code looks the same. So it makes it a lot easier to read all of this code. Yeah. And PSR2 is coding uh, style guide. So this is more about the style, so you use four spaces for indenting instead of tabs and stuff like that. And if you really want to use tabs, there's always ways to have your IDE convert the tabs to spaces when you save the file. Um, it's, it's stuff like that that's in the PSR2. Then PSR3 is a logger interface, and this should make it a lot easier to replace one logging solution with another logging solution, um, so that, well, it doesn't really matter which logging you are using uh, and which framework you are using. It's like if you're using Symfony and then at some point you want to put in, pull in some uh, Zen Framework component that, that uses the logger, uh, then you could use Zen Framework logger, but you can also use Monolog if you're using Symfony. Does, does the Zen Framework logger implement this? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, it's brand this standard. And uh, I. I want to have that basically these are standard for you know framework uh, interoperability but are also good uh, if you want to apply a standard in your daily job if you're working for a company if you don't have a standard maybe you can you know check it out uh, this uh, standard in order to be you know compliant with the PHP framework the PHP community the PHP library because 
right now this is a standard by the de facto standard so I strongly suggest yes <laughs> So, and to make our life even easier when using multiple frameworks, there is Composer. Anyone here has worked with Composer before? Most, most of you. So to those who have not used Composer yet, uh, I would recommend looking at Composer because it makes your life a whole lot easier. Composer um, does dependency management. So basically you say, I want to use this component from Zen Framework and I want to use this component from Symfony. And then Composer will start uh, looking at all the dependencies for those components and install those as well. So you only have to worry about what you actually need and not about the dependencies of those packages. And that's recursive. So if, the, uh, if a package has a dependency on another package and that one has a dependency on another package and that one has a dependency on another package, I'm just describing Zen Framework 1 here, then... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Then it will install all of them at the same time. Um, so luckily with Zen Framework 2, this is a lot less. This is actually quite nice. Um, so if you go to getcomposer.org, you can simply download the file. Uh, you can create the composer.json file, which lists your, only your dependencies. And then you do composer install. And then composer will download all the packages and install them into the vendor directory. And before you say, I don't want a vendor directory, I want a library directory, that's fine, you can do that, you can configure that with Composer. So, yeah, so now, uh, as uh, Stefan said, we basically changed uh, the content of our presentation two days ago, and uh, we come out with an idea. So imagine that you have an existing uh, Symfony 2 application, and you want to mm, create an API around that. So uh, I will show you how to do using AppAgility, so that is actually uh, add Zen framework uh, to projects in order to build uh, API. So uh, with AppAgility basically you can uh, create API for you know PHP general project and uh, we manage RESTful and RPC uh, API so you can choose whatever you want. We manage error handling for you, authentication, validation and filtering, content negotiation, and uh, last but not least, versioning. So it's quite, uh, I think, interesting project. So if you have to start to build uh, uh, an API in your PHP project, I strongly suggest to have a look at AppAgility. And actually, this is the website, uh, is appagility.org. <coughs> so uh, of course, we use Composer so to install uh, AppAgility. So the Actually, there are three ways to install AppAgility. You can just uh, download uh, the release from the GitHub repository in Targo or Zip. You can uh, install it using uh, uh, Composer, or you can just clone the project that is actually uh, CF AppAgility Skeleton. So that's the name of the main package that provides for you the skeleton of the API uh, project. And after that, basically, you have to uh, enable the uh, develop mode uh, of AppAgility, because basically AppAgility is a tool to create API, so it's for you know, a developer. Uh, in order to enable it, you can just run the simple script with this parameter, development enable. And after that, basically, you are ready to start to use AppAgility. Of course, because we provide a user interface that is actually a web application, written in AngularJS, because we wrote you know, the uh, Ad Agility admin interface as an API first uh, application. That means we built the API and we provide the client in AngularJS to consume the API. So the Agility project itself is an API first application, of course, because we want to you know, uh, provide uh, a good example for you know, PHP people, so maybe this is also interesting to have a look at you know, the Angular uh, JS application that we built. So, if you don't want to, you know, install, uh, uh, configure a web server in order to consume the application, you can just use the internal PHP web server. So, if you have PHP 5.4.9, and I'm uh, saying this explicit version because starting from that version, you have. A, the, the, the patch method, HTTP method inside the web server, so that's why uh, you need uh, that specific version. 
you can just execute uh, uh, on the command line the, the usual uh, syntax in order to create, to execute uh, uh, a web server. And you can go, in this example, we are uh, mounting uh, the uh, Apigility uh, ad admin in the localhost to, uh, to that port. So you can just go open your browser and you will see something like that. This is the, the, the first page uh, with uh, this amazing uh, logo of Apigility. You can click on the Get Started and uh, you will have something uh, like that. So basically a very simple dashboard. Right now Apigility is uh, in version 0.7. So, uh, you know, the, it's not so cool, the, uh, the interface, uh, let me say, but it works. And actually we use a bootstrap free, so we try to use you know, the latest technology for, you know, even for CSS. Does, does that mean that I can use the GeoCities bootstrap theme? Yeah, of course. Awesome. Animated GIFs for the win. Yeah. And actually, if you are interested, you contribute to the project and you are a web designer or you know, a user interface designer, you are more than welcome to, you know, to help us to building you know, the web application. We are more PHP server-side oriented developer than you know, a UI, actually. Anyway, uh, the, the interface is like that, so you can just uh, use that interface to create your API. So this is the cool uh, feature of the project. Uh, it's not just uh, you know a framework to build API. It's actually an application for developer to help you know the uh, the building the process of the API. So ever, everything that you can do, you can do using this uh, web interface. So um, as I said, we want to start from an existing Symfony application, and we want to create API using uh, uh, Apigility. The idea here is that we want to really use the Symfony 2 application. So we don't want to write other PHP code in order to you know, call or emulate the Symfony application. We want to use the existing uh, Symfony 2 application. So you have to, of course, create a new API using uh, the web interface. So just clicking on the button, I want to create an API. For instance, the name is POST, because in this example we are uh, we are using a simple uh, blog application, so we have this entity uh, that are the posts. You have to specify the, the, the URL, the root. So in this case, we have slash post, and uh, we have also this optional parameter ID that identify the specific uh, uh, post. So this is completely restful uh, syntax. Uh, you have to specify the identifier name of your entity. In this case, it's just ID and the collection that is post. After that, you need to edit the configuration. So basically, uh, um, here we, we need to change the, the default configuration of the Apigility in order to set the entity of the Symfony 2 uh, projects. So basically, in Symfony 2, as you can, as I, I know you are familiar with that, you basically use Doctrine most of the time. So basically you have uh, uh, you know, some entities in Doctrine and you have also the possibility to specify an additional layer that are the service. So usually you, you define the service that consume the Doctrine entities. So that's the idea, in order to have you know, another layer more generally to, to use. So if you have uh, these uh, uh, services in Symfony, basically you, you just need to say to Apigility, please use this entity instead of the default one of Apigility. Basically, that's, uh, uh, that's the idea. And, uh, you know, we have some uh, technical details here, but are not uh, uh, important. And we will, uh, uh, actually, we will uh, update uh, the example on, uh, on GitHub. So uh, after, uh, you know, the presentation, if you are interested, you can come out to us and ask for more uh, details. Of course, because we want to use Apigility to consume the Symfony application, we have to teach Apigility how to you know, include all the dependencies of your Symfony projects. So basically, the composer.json of your Symfony project needs to be merged inside the composer.json of Apigility. So this is an example. Uh, in the first row, you have uh, you know, the required part of the composer of uh, uh, Apigility, basically, and you start, you have to edit and add the dependency of your Symfony application in order to have just one 
outer order, basically. That's the, that's the idea. After that, uh, this is actually the interesting part. Um, you need to uh, change uh, um, the post resource of Apigility. Even in Apigility, we have some you know resource, and one of these is the post that we created uh, using the uh, UI interface. So basically, uh, you you want to bootstrap in uh, that post service the Symfony application and consuming the services of the Symfony inside Apigility. That's the general idea. Of course, we don't want to bootstrap all the workflow of the Symfony application, so we won't just to, uh, we, we don't want, for instance, manage the HTTP request and response of a typical Symfony application because we don't, we don't need it. We want just to consume the model part of an existing Symfony 2 application. That's uh, basically the goal. And we need the um, Symfony service container because that's where we register the service that can access uh, the entity. Yeah, uh, basically uh, the integration is just this line of code, actually. Because here we are in the post resource components of Agility. So uh, we have just to, um, uh, as Stefan said, specify the, the path. You have to specify the path of your Symfony application. And uh, we are just uh, consuming the app kernel, that is a core component of Symfony, that basically uh, start the kernel of the application. And there are two calls here. One is about the load class cache, and the other is the boot. So this is boot. This is very important. Because this is actually is the, the function that start up the Symfony application, the bootstrap the, the, the Symfony application. And after that, we are just getting from uh, the service container of uh, uh, Symfony, the service that we need. In this case, in this example, it was post service. And we are just storing in a uh, protected uh, uh, variable of this class. So that is actually the code that you need to change in order to consume a Symfony model inside the uh, Agility. It's important to note that uh, for the people that are experienced with Symfony 2, uh, we are actually using an extra layer between our controller and Doctrine. The default way in the, in the Symfony documentation is to call Doctrine directly from the controller. Um, but we've added a service layer between that. And the idea of adding a service layer between that is obviously that you don't, the, the whole controller doesn't need to know about the database. It doesn't need to know about where it stores the data. That's what the service layer is for. And that's the class we're getting here. Yeah, actually, this is uh, the, the service uh, that Stefan was talking about. So as you can see, this is a simple class that consume a doctrine object inside Symfony. And uh, actually, we had uh, um, a couple of you know, methods in order to get the information from the model. So for instance, if you want to get all the posts, you have just to uh, you know, use this uh, uh, function here, find all, that is the usual you know, function inside the uh, uh, doctrine basically. So this is a grouper, is a layer between a doctrine basically. And that's it. I mean, after you do that, you can, uh, we are here now in Apigility, so in the class of Apigility, where you have all the methods that maps, you know, the basically the restful action that you can consume. For instance, we have, a, if you want to, to, to do a get uh, on a specific post, we have a fetch method, and uh, as you can see, we are just wrapping around the post service, that the object that we built during the construction of this uh, uh, component. And we are just calling get in this case, and get all in this another case, because we want a collection here. So if you do get post, uh, basically it's just uh, uh, the, the collection. Okay. I think uh, now is yes. Time. So now is uh, so now is my turn. Uh, so now we we've got an API up and running, and this was actually we we got it up and running in 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 a very short time yesterday. Um, and now my Symfony application obviously right now is still talking um, directly to the database, but because we want to use this API that we've just created in Symfony. Uh, we should actually try to do try to call that uh, uh, API, um, and as a great example of using Zen Framework two inside the Symfony application, 
uh, I can use the Zen Service API module um, that Zen Framework is offering, uh, which is specific for calling an API. Well, that's, that's interesting. So um, I had this project. So usually when you start a new Symfony project, you start off with a Composer Create project, um, a Symfony Framework Standard Edition, and then the name of your project, which is the directory where it's installed in. So then I have a new project. Uh, I only have to update the Composer file to include Zen Framework slash Zen Service API and uh, run Composer install, and it will install this module for me as well. Uh, that was Composer install. So this is what you see, uh, and this is what I mentioned earlier with the Composer stuff. Uh, I only specified uh, the, the, the API, Zen Service API uh, component, and this is what Composer does. It actually looks at all of the different dependencies of Zen Service API and installs those. And actually, now it's downloading everything. If I would do it again, it would actually load it from cache, so it's a lot easier. So now in the vendor folder of my Symfony application, aside from all of the uh, uh, standard Symfony stuff, now there's a Zen Framework directory as well, where, which is where all of the dependencies have been installed. So now I can actually start some work. So Zen Service API, just a quick introduction, is a simple, uh, well, component. It's, it's sort of an HTTP framework. Uh, which makes it a lot easier to start calling APIs. It does a lot of the, the groundwork for that. I mean, you can use any HTTP client, obviously, to, to call an API, but the Zen Service API actually calls, or does a, a lot more for, for you, like authentication and stuff, um, makes it a lot easier. Um, so, uh, it, uh, uh, under the water, it uses a Zen HTTP client, uh, which makes sense for a Zen Framework component. Um, and it's, it's up on GitHub, so you can look at it. Let's get to work. Um, so the API should be a Symfony 2 service, right? So I create a simple API service, which is a, a basically a wrapper class uh, that, that allows me to have a very simple implementation inside my Symfony project, and I don't have to update my Symfony project a lot to actually get this to work. So I create a simple service class um, called API service where the client can be um, injected through the constructor. So I can just register that in my uh, service configuration. And, and then I've abstracted most of the setup work into a separate init file, which I call in the constructor. So this is the constructor. I just get the client uh, and, and call the init. And then this is the init. And this is how you set up uh, the Zen Service API um, module. I just basically say, okay, so in the API there is a blog get method, and this is just my name. Um, and once the, that method is being called, uh, just execute this. And so this is just a configuration, so this is the post uh, that Enrico created earlier, and I just uh, I request JSON in this case. It's a get method, uh, and it should only return uh, a 200. If it returns anything else, that's an error. So having done that, now this is my controller, and it's the, it's this easy. <laughs> this is I just get the API service from the service container. I call the raw get function that I just defined and that returns posts. So in this case, it's just a, a JSON, right? I still need to parse the JSON, but for this example, I've just returned the posts uh, back to the, uh, to the view so that Symfony can actually parse a view and show the posts. So it's just that easy to, to implement this in my Symfony. Oh, this is interesting. Ah, there we go. Some of them are actually appearing and others are there already. So it's that easy. Uh, there's a lot more stuff in, in Zen Framework that I'm not showing you right now, but that can be very useful uh, for, for your Symfony application, like uh, generating barcodes with barcode or captchas with captcha. Uh, crypt is very interesting, and Rico built that, which uh, makes it a lot easier to encrypt stuff um, and decrypt it afterwards with some methods. 
Uh, then there's of course SendFeed and i18 and, and all of the Zend service uh, components are very interesting as well. So it's your turn again. Yes. So now, uh, very briefly, I will just to give you some idea how to integrate Symfony 2 in a Zend framework to uh, projects. So basically, um, the idea here is of course you have to include uh, the Symfony components that you want to use in uh, Composer.json. So you have to have basically these uh, mm, uh, libraries that you want to consume and execute uh, the update uh, command. So basically there are uh, two ways to, uh, to consume uh, uh, Symfony 2 components inside the framework. You know, um, the, the MVC approach is just to register the Symfony 2 components in uh, the service manager of, of the framework. And the standard approach, of course, is just to use the components as is. So you have to instantiate the class and use it. Of course, I suggest to use, uh, especially if you are building a really MVC application, the first uh, meetup, so using the, the, the service manager. So for instance, <coughs> imagine that you want to use uh, the YAML and the DOM crawler uh, components of Symfony in your Zen Framework 2 project. They actually are nice components that we don't have basically in a Zen framework, so that's one of the reasons to use it. You have just to come out, uh, just to have these two lines. And actually, um, to config uh, the uh, service manager, you can use the, the invocables uh, services, that are specific services of the Zen framework uh, uh, too. And you can specify the name with the full path of the components. And, uh, and that's it. I mean, very, very uh, simple. Uh, if you want, you can also use the factory services. There are another you know, uh, type of services inside the um, Zen framework, uh, where factory means the, design, the factory design pattern. So it basically means if you have some parameters that you need to consume in order to create an object, you can use these uh, uh, services. This is actually the, the, the factory uh, part. So for instance, uh, here we are uh, defining uh, the DOM crawler, um, you passing the HTML, so that is a, a string basically, and we are creating, we are returning uh, an instance of these components, passing the uh, dollar HTML parameter. Even if you are not, uh, if you don't need to, um, you know, uh, use a specific factory, you can just use factory as is, specifying uh, as we did the, the, for the invocables, because in this way, if you in the future needs to you know change uh, something uh, in, for the creation of the object, you already have that in the factory, so you can just uh, uh, use it basically. And uh, for instance, in uh, how to consume that uh, in, inside a controller, very very simple. We get the service uh, locator with this uh, uh, helper function, get service locator, and we just getting the YAML parser and the DOM crawler. That's it, and you can just use it. So the integration is very, very simple. So there are, of course, a lot of other nice components uh, in Symfony 2, like, for instance, the browser kit, the CSS selector, the file system, uh, and so on, that maybe uh, Zen Framework 2 developers can uh, use it in uh, their uh, daily work. OK, so now the conclusion. Yes. So. To, to integrate something uh, between different frameworks, uh, what helps wh where we started was uh, the PSR standards. And the, the PSR standards are used by the frameworks, but uh, it would be a good idea to also use it in your own custom code base because it will make your life a whole lot easier. Um, if you do it, it makes it a lot easier to have your own reusable components and install those into your projects using Composer. Um, because Composer will by default look for PSR zero uh, uh, naming conventions and then look beyond that. Um, uh, you can configure to, to use other auto loading standards, but really the PSR zero makes it a lot easier. So then you've got Composer, then you just pick different components from Zen Framework and Symfony, uh, and, and you know, there's so many other libraries out there that you can also use um, and that also support Composer. So don't just stop at using Symfony or Zen Framework, but go beyond that as well. Uh, basically, don't reinvent the wheel. That's, that's a very, the most important message 
uh, that, that you should take away today. Don't reinvent the wheel, look at the other stuff that's out there already. Usually it will do whatever you want it to do. Packages is very important uh, for those that don't know the website yet. Packages.org is where you can look for libraries that are installable using Composer. Really, anything you want to implement, it's already there. Someone's built it before you did. So really have a look at Packagist when you need new functionality for your project. Yeah, actually, that's all. Yes. So, Please let us know how we did, especially because this is basically a new version of this yes. talk. So go to join in uh, 9364 uh, to give, give us your feedback. What, what did we do right and what can we do better next time so we can improve for the next time? Um, so that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. It's question time. We have uh, two books to give away to the best questions. So give us your best question. French book. <laughs> Hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, did you experiment some memory problems on the web servers when bootstrapping two full stack frameworks at the same time? Yeah, of course, depending on uh, the use case, we just provide uh, a simple example here. Uh, if you need specific uh, you know, functionality, because usually API should be very fast, very performance. So if you just need to consume, uh, let's say, a doctrine entities, you can optimize that process just including you know, the doctrine components that you really need in, during the bootstrap and consuming it. Of course, this is a performance, but you know, in this way, actually, is a starter. So you can start to reuse it, check, you know, the response time, the amount of memory that uh, you are consuming, and after you can refine, you know, okay, maybe I don't know, I don't need this, I don't need that, so you can just, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a first example of integration, actually. And it's also, um, the only thing we did was uh, just to bootstrap the basic stuff of Symfony so that we would have the service container available. It wouldn't do any parsing of the request and stuff like that. We, we left that out. We just wanted to get the service container up and running. Yes, okay. just the bootstrap. So no, no full stack? No, no, it's not full stack. If you, if you compare, actually, if we go back to the example, it's quite uh, simple to show. If you compare, uh, if I can find it, yeah, yeah that one. Uh, this line basically are uh, the line that you can, uh, these lines are basically similar to the code that you have in your app.php file under the web folder. If you, if you go inside, you will see that there is, you know, the app kernel, uh, the dot class cache. You, you, we are not using explicitly in app.php file of Symfony this boot. Methods, so we are calling uh, explicitly because we want just to bootstrap, you know, the application. But we are not using all the entire HTTP request response, uh, you know, class. Where actually, where Symfony to do the, the real job, gets the HTTP request, do the routing, uh, and so on. So it's in some way already optimized. I can say. Okay. Thank you. And second question: If if you organize a Resting fight between Matthew and Fabian. Who will win? <laughs> no one, I think. Thank you. Hi. Um, the reason you can um, make Symfony 2 and Zen Framework 2 in interact is because of the PSR 0. And uh, basically, the more PSR we have, and the more uh, possibility we have to interface uh, frameworks. Uh, PSR 3 is one year old now, and uh, when you follow the PHP FIG mailing list, you see it's kind of hard to make new PSRs uh, come to light. So what's your thought about that? Are you rather optimistic or pessimistic about the you know, when you manage uh, an open source project, when you want to, you know, it's always difficult because behind software there are people and people are difficult. 
you know? So it's, it's not as bad as internal stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's not that bad, <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, but it's a challenge. So, you know, you have to be very diplomatic. Uh, you have to, you know, send a nice proposal, you know, try again and again. If you want to, you know, to be part of that uh, amazing uh, community, you have to, you know, be patient. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, but I'm optimistic. I mean, we, we come out with, uh, with this uh, important standard that are, as you said, PSR 0, 1, 2. Now we are, you know, proposing uh, a little bit more logging, caching. There are uh, an infinite thread about caching on the mailing list. But, you know, actually it's good even uh, sometimes spend time to read uh, uh, the, the real, uh, you know, proposal, not the, the thread, uh, the, the reply, you know, with, uh, I, I, I don't like this, I don't like that. Uh, maybe, you know, the, the first, <laughs> the start of the first, uh, you know, post are uh, for me interesting. Hi. Uh, what about the, the robustness uh, of a project based in, uh, in this two framework? You mean uh, uh, if this framework are robust or not? Or? No, no, no. Uh, at, uh, at the start, we have uh, Team 22 and uh, the, uh, Zen Framework 2. Yes. But the association of the two framework in uh, one project is uh, it is difficult to maintain this kind of project, uh, this kind of, uh, of project. No, 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 because uh, we are just uh, you are just consuming, uh, uh, you know, components. Because of course you, you cannot uh, uh, do together the entire MVC stack of Symfony two and Zen Framework two because they manage differently, of course. So you, we are just uh, um, showing you in this uh, presentation how to get some components from Symfony and from Zen, Zen Framework. And, but you have to choose, you know, which is your main MVC framework. So you have to choose, okay, I want to use Zen Framework 2 for instance, yeah. because it's the only one framework uh, uh, available right now. And you can just say, okay, I want to use this general uh, component of uh, Symfony, or vice versa, of course. And actually, I've recently done some playing around, uh, and I'm really liking that you can just take a couple of components because you need not every project will need a full stack. So um, uh, recently I worked with a project where I just took the HTTP foundation of Symfony and, and took some other component libraries and components and I didn't use a full stack framework at all. Um, but because they're all very, very decoupled and I just have a composer file just listing the, the couple of components that I need and I can, I can get a website up and running very quickly as well. Yeah, for maybe, yes, Silex. Yeah. But with Silex, uh, it's, yes, that's basically the idea of Silex. It's, it's, very, it's very flattened down, so there's only a couple of components, just the basics that you need. But even without Silex, you can just take a couple of components and create your own framework. And where, uh, like uh, four years ago, five years ago, everyone would write their own framework. Now you can just use the existing components and create your own framework with that. That was a question where just a, a follow-up on it as a data point. Drupal 8 is using about nine Symfony components plus Zen Feed plus Guzzle um, and a whole bunch of other components. So you can do an awful lot mixing and matching from both projects and you can probably throw Aura in there as well if you wanted to. There's a, the potential of this kind of approach is huge, uh, whatever your primary framework happens to be. Yeah. It's impossible, of course, from even from a business point of view, <clears throat> if you trust in some, you know, framework, library, whatever, you, you should, you know, check uh, behind the library, behind the framework, if there is a company, uh, the size of the community, uh, the last uh, commit on GitHub. These are kind of, you know, uh, signal that you can check in order to understand if the library, if the framework is robust or not. Maybe, maybe these are, you know, Good suggestion, and of course behind the, the project like uh, Drupal, uh, some framework, Symfony, Gazelle, there are you know a lot of people working, so you are quite uh, sure that uh, the framework or the library will not disappear from day by day. That's a good point from a business point of view too. Yeah. 
always check the community behind uh, the, the projects. This, uh, I think it's very important. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Another question? Uh, one more. <laughs> one more question. Uh, just in this way, um, do you think um, the future uh, frameworks will no longer be necessary? I mean, uh, we can just choose some package we need and do our own framework. I mean, do you think it's still necessary now or in the future to choose one framework and try to uh, integrate some uh, package of other frameworks into? Actually, that's a very good question. I think it depends <laughs> on the project. Um, for, for one of my clients last year, uh, I did three or four different projects. And one was a Symfony full stack project. One was a Silex project. One was a plain PHP project. Um, I think it depends on the project what you uh, want to choose. And sometimes the full stack will make it your life a lot easier. Uh, and sometimes you really don't need the full stack and you don't want to use it. Yeah, in my opinion, because you know now we have standard, we have way to interface from one library framework to another. For sure, we will see more you know melting pot, let's say, of PHP application. But for about the if you want to use MVC architecture, for sure you. You, you need to choose one because it's quite difficult to imagine an MVC future where you have a, you know, a controller coming from Symfony that talks to a view of some framework and so on. I mean, it's also complicated to manage, from a, especially from a business point of view, because if you have you know, some framework the people uh, that are strong on the framework, maybe they are not so strong on Symfony and vice versa. So, you know, the core should be one, in my opinion. but. The library and the components can be whatever you want. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I like your question, so you can come and pick a book. You also pick a question that was good.